started recording. Please, I've been asked to tell everybody that you are all being recorded. So for a few minutes, I want us to just lift Nigeria because of what's been happening. Um, I'd like us to just kind of pray for the country. We've all been listening to the news. I don't even have to raise a prayer point at this point because we've all been hearing it. We've all been because we a lot of people, in fact, non-Nigerians have heard what's happening in Nigeria. So if, even if you're a non-Nigerian, you know that at this time or in the last week, there has been a lot of violence in Nigeria, a lot of bloodshed in Nigeria. And so can we just take a minute or two to lift Nigeria up and to pray that God would rescue the country, God would save the nation. Please, can we just, just take a minute or two to pray for justice in Nigeria, to pray for peace in Nigeria, to pray for prosperity, to pray for revival in Nigeria, to pray that those who are standing up for the, for the name of Jesus Christ in Nigeria, to pray that the Lord will honor them, to pray the Lord would rescue them, to pray the world would hear, but more importantly, that the Lord will hear. I know he hears. I know he hears. And I know that as we are all present, no matter where we are in the country or all over the world, he's hearing us. So can we just, just take some time to lift our voices to God and to pray to God right now for our country? Just, just raise your voices. Just cry unto the Lord. Just shout unto the Lord. Just, just tell God to remember Nigeria, to bring peace to Nigeria. Just bring what's happening in Nigeria. Just speak in your own words, speak in tongues. If, 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 if it's too hard for you to put in words, you know, the spirit grows. We can speak in tongues. Just lift Nigeria up to the king of kings, to the one who hears us, to the one who knows, to the one who sees, to the one who says, I have heard the cry of my people. Let's just spend some time and lift that country up right now. It's a big country. It's a diverse country. It's a rich country. I mean, all of us who are right here, we're the cream of Nigeria. We, we are people who were educated in the country, who saw the prosperity of Nigeria, who know, we know what Nigeria can be. Can we just lift that country up right now to the king of kings and just say, Lord, intervene, Lord, intervene, Lord, intervene in Nigeria. Even, it says in the Bible, even the hearts of kings and of rulers he can do with it what he wills. There is no one, no one in Nigeria right now that's beyond the reach of God. Not the head of state, not, not anybody else at all. No policeman, no SARS, or whatever they're newly called now, that's beyond the reach of Nigeria. Can we just lift the country up and just pray that the Lord would turn the heart of the leaders Turn the hearts of the rulers, turn the hearts of those who are currently looting and stealing our country's wealth. Turn them all around. I know that a lot of people say that Nigeria was a colonial thingy, was a colonial invention, but I do not believe that God made a mistake when he created Nigeria. I cannot believe that because if God made a mistake when he created Nigeria, then it means God makes mistakes. If God doesn't make mistakes, then God did not make a mistake when he created Nigeria. So we need to lift Nigeria up to God to take complete control. To lift the country up out of this darkness, this depression, this corruption. To just lift the country up. I wonder if two people can just help us by concluding this time of prayer. Any two people? Can we just have two people? I, I, is, any two people, can, can any two people just unmute themselves and just conclude this time of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering this evening. Uh, you say where two or three people are gathered, so there you will you be. Father, we want to thank you for the entity called Nigeria. Uh, as our brother has said, uh, we were put together because you wanted it to be so. 
further, there's a lot of strife uh, taking place in our country. Uh, we turn to you, we seek your face, we seek for your intervention, Lord, uh, in what's going on in our country. We pray, Heavenly Father, that peace will reign in that land, that all the blood that has been shed, Father, we, we come to you, Father, and ask for forgiveness on behalf of our rulers, on behalf of the nation, Lord. We pray, Father, that you restore peace unto that land, that you heal the land, Lord. Father, we turn unto you. It's only you we have, uh, uh, and it's only you who can restore that country back to glory, Lord. We pray for our leaders. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in their quiet times you speak to them. Father, you can change the heart of kings. We pray for our president. We pray that you speak to him, those in authority, Lord. Father, for the populace, for the citizens who may be feeling hopeless and rejected, we pray, Father, that you give us peace of mind, that we will know your joy. Father, Nigeria, we pray for that country, that you restore it to glory. We pray for the youth of the country, Lord, that, Father, you will uphold them, that you will keep them. We pray against the pandemic, Lord, because things are happening where people are gathering in large numbers. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the pestilence shall not ravage our country. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Anyone else? Lord, we thank you because we know you hear us. Lord, you said to us that if we ask in your name, that our Heavenly Father will hear us. Lord God, we thank you because of the promise that comes with being born again. We have just highlighted that you said in this world we would have difficulties, but we thank you that that was not the end of the story. You said we should not worry because you have overcome the world. We stand, no matter what we're going through, in a place of victory. We stand in a place where you said there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord God, and as we stand here, wherever we are in the world, Lord, we lift up our country Nigeria to you. And for those who are non-Nigerians who are joining us, we thank you that people from all over the world know that something is happening in Nigeria that is worth crying to you for. And Lord God, as we have cried, Lord God, we pray that you answer. Lord, we pray you transform this country. Your word says you can do beyond what we can ask or imagine. So Lord, we are imagining great things for Nigeria. We imagine a sudden transformation for Nigeria. We imagine peace for Nigeria. We imagine justice for Nigeria. We imagine because we know you can do beyond what we ask or what we imagine. We bring this to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Again, I, will, I just want to thank everyone who's come today. Um, I'm sorry we started a little bit late. Uh, actually, it's partly my fault. I, I have to confess. Um, I, I pretended I could run everything properly. Um, so what we're going to do, the plan was to end at nine, but I don't think, I, I hope you can bear with us if it goes slightly um, above and beyond nine o'clock. Um, on the, the second Saturday of um, October, which I think was the 10th of October, I had the distinct honor and the distinct pleasure of hearing um, Malam Nuhu Haruna speak to the NEC of the OFNC. And what he said touched my heart and touched many hearts as well. But I, I do believe very strongly that his message was for the NEC, but was for the membership of the OFNC too. I think it's good that the NEC heard what he said. And I even think it's good that the OFNC hears, but I think it's even better that the whole world hears, which is why this is being recorded. And it will be on YouTube too. 
I think it's a wonderful thing that God has given us opportunity. In the days of Jesus, he would speak um, um, in a boat and only the people around him would hear. But now the whole world can hear and the whole world should hear what is happening, how people are glorifying God in difficult circumstances. And I, I use that word without regret or anything because this is what Jesus said about Peter. Yeah, this is what was written in John when, when Jesus spoke to Peter. I said, you know, now that you are young, you will um, do you go wherever you want to go. He said, when you are old, people will take you to where you don't want to go. And I remember reading that bit and reading the verse after. And what John said was, Jesus spoke of the way Peter would glorify him. I was like, wow. This is how Peter glorifies God. But I think it's good that we hear this and that the whole world hears what Malam Nuhu Haruna has to say. Um, I will leave him to fully introduce himself and then to speak. And after that, we'll take some questions. Now, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, I think I can. So if it works, great. If you can put your questions on the chat box, excellent. If not, we'll just unmute and ask the questions. I'm sure you don't mind. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we start, can someone just pray for Malam Haruna for a minute and then we can start? Anyone? Father, we are not fit for what you are calling us to do. We pray your anointing upon your son, your protection by the blood of Jesus, not only upon him, but upon his whole household. Indeed, upon all our brethren, especially in the north of Nigeria, where this has been going on for so long. I pray against discouragement in any of their lives in Jesus' name. I release supernatural joy in the name of Jesus. Grace, Lord, to go through this period that will surprise even themselves in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And I pray, Lord, that you will touch each of us as our brother speaks to us tonight and strengthen us, Father, in our resolve to keep praying and trusting you and walking to see the end of injustice in our nation in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless Brother Ife as well, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, brethren. And I thank you for giving me the privilege to come and speak to you on the persecuted church of Nigeria. I want to start first and foremost by acknowledging the issues of the moment and I thank you for your prayer earlier for our beloved country for the prayers that go said. And uh, I want to say our heart go to the family, the beret, those who lost once uh, due to the uh, shooting by members of our own armed forces of us at the Lake Polgate. Uh we uh, the Lord will grant the family to bear the loss of their life. Thank you again for the privilege of uh giving me audience to come and speak to you. The situation Situation the ground in Nigeria is a situation where there is a continuous and unabated massacre of people, most often carried out in the night when they are asleep, men, women, and children being murdered. And at the moment, we are we are talking to close a million people that have been displaced from their homes with over 11,000 people from 2011 to this date. Displaced from their homes and herded into ADB camps where they are not even being cared for. Those who could make it to relatives do make it to relatives. 
communities in nearby towns and villages. And taken over by Fulani Harassmen. These Fulani Harassmen are not are either Nigerians or not Nigerians, but in most cases they are not Nigerians. They are people who have just been allowed to come in, uh, across our frontiers uh, to come and plunder our land. Now the situation is they are attacking with connivance of government authority. How does it happen? Like traditional rulers, more than 15 traditional rulers have been murdered. They are not allowed to be reinstalled. Instead, when the Fulanis have a camp nearby, they will install an emir there. And this is ongoing. The prominent one is the case of the Adara chieftain, which has gone viral for many, many months now in Kaduna State, where the paramount chief, a first class chief, was murdered. He has not been replaced to this day. And what is even happening is that his courtiers and all people of his, uh, of his uh, uh, working with him have either been arrested or they've gone into hiding. And Trump under Trump up charges. This is the situation in Northern Nigeria today. Now, the question is, how did we come about getting to this position that we are in now? Well, Nigeria before independence was invaded by Ottoman Danfodi. Uh, the first casualty are the Hausa tribe, the Hausa tribe, the Hausa chiefs, the Hausa uh, Habe chiefs. In 1804, they swept through Hausa land until they got to Maduguri and they could not conquer the Kanuri people, and then they turned down south. On coming down south, they met with other tribes. These other tribes numbering over 400 in number in Northern Nigeria, the area known as Northern Nigeria today, fiercely resisted the onslaught of the Fulanese for more than 100 years. But, uh, the Danfodio started his jihad in 1804, but up to the time the British arrived and conquered Sokoto in 1914, they've not covered the whole north. They have had successes uh, lowering to the west, but definitely to the east, they were not all that successful. However, what happened after the north was colonized, fully colonized by Lord Louis Gadwes? A betrayal. Because the tribes signed a treaty with the British to be under the direct rule of the queen. However, what happened was the British went into a marriage alliance with the emirs and areas that they, where they were fiercely resisted were simply handed over to them under the indirect rule system. So this is the decision before independence. So that gave them all uh, swathes of land, like is what was what is today known as Kaduna State was then known as Zaria Province. So the whole of Zaria Province came under the Emir of Zaria, even with the chiefs that actually signed a treaty directly with the Queen. So at independence, again, another second betrayal. The British were desperate to leave Nigeria. So, so as they were desperate to leave Nigeria, they did not consider areas of difference. All they were interested, they just simply identify the Fulanis in their own opinion as the best people that will rule Nigeria. So they considered the best people that will rule the whole of Nigeria, let alone the talk of the north. They simply handed over the entire north, the entire tribe, the Jukun, the Thieves, the Biroms, and everybody else handed them over to Amadou Bello, who is a grandson of Othman Danfodi. So I'm becoming premier of Northern Region. 
1960, October 1960. Amadou Bello did not waste any time. He made a proclamation that the territory known as Nigeria today will be considered as an estate of his grandfather, Othman Danfodio. The non minors will be considered as willing peoples, and southern Nigeria will be considered as conquered territory. They should ruthlessly be resisted. They will never be allowed to take over the affairs of themselves. And they should never be allowed to ever rule over Nigeria. That was the declaration. This was recorded in the Parrot newspaper on the 12th of mm -hmm. October 1960. So barely 12 days after independence, Amadou Bello is talking of his plan for Nigeria as a whole, beginning with the North. In the West, of course, you know, what was happening is that the West and the East, they were all planning a different agenda. Our law has already started free education in the West, and I can tell that, try to continue with it. And so also, Zeke started uh, in the East, uh, their own plan on how to advance technologically with education, with industry, but in the north, it's nothing but Islamization. The strategy Amadou Velo deployed was first and foremost converting the entire non-Muslim chiefs. They were all converted into Islam. Few resisted. So it was in Jobs, and the chief of Kaburu, they resisted his conversion bid and he punished them by never allowing them to ascend to the position of being first class chiefs. The chief of God is, is supposed to be the traditional ruler of the Nasarawa on the state. Because that was what you know, was none of the part where was proposed, that we left him there as a second class chief. And despite the plateau being the highest producer of revenue for Northern Nigeria, in terms of tin, no good words was ever tied to Joss. And Joss up to this, up to this day has remained the focus of attack and capture by Islamists. Now, at independence, in 1914, there were just about 14 converts in Sokoto, according to the record that we have by the Sudan Interior Mission. But at independence, across northern Nigeria, across all the denominations, there were about 500,000 Christians. So when independence came, and Christianity was just beginning to get traction. The entire north was handed over to an Islamist. It was like a death sentence. But there's nothing we could do about it. The British were prepared to leave, and all we have uh, left with the best. But the difference is, at the time, these converts were first who have either converted from Islam or from traditional religion into Christianity. And despite the agenda that Amadou Bello had for the North to turn Nigeria into an estate of his grandfather, Othman Danfodio, this few, this band of believers, because they were true faithful who are living, who are living to the teaching of the scriptures, simply soldiered on. And this, what did they do? They simply obeyed. Obeyed what the Lord said, go ye into the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always. And that is exactly what they did. So we are talking, despite all the effort 
persecution by government, recruiting and putting Islamic teachers on salaries, the church has grown. Now, having done all that they could do and failing, that is what we are seeing. That is why we are seeing what we are seeing today. That is resorting to violence. Don't have any doubt in your mind. This violence is being perpetrated not just by those people you see as full and When it's so the government, they say it's an age. They will say it's mandatory. They will never admit that they have a hand in it. When they want to even be kind, they will say it's a reprisal attack. Or ultimately, they will simply ignore and keep quiet. You see, with all the thousands of lives lost, you will never, you've never had any emir or any Islam, uh, Muslim minister, all of them even to certain sponsored act of terrorism. An AK-47 costs about 500,000 Naira to buy. I'm yet to understand, I don't know, but that's the figure. How come Fulani husband have it just like, you know, almost every Fulani man can afford to have one? So, but that is a way that they are now using to make sure they stem the tide that Christians are no longer able to meet. It has been the practice that we can go to villages and preach. We can no longer be able to, we can't even go back to farms, let alone to talk of going to preach. So, the injustice did not just stop there. When Othman, when Amadou Bello became premier, in preparation for perfecting his plan mm -hmm. to Islamize the whole Nigeria, don't forget that he was supposed to become prime minister, but he refused because he knew he couldn't handle the likes of our law in opposition and Namdi as a So he decided that he was just stay as premier and dispatch uh, Tapabala to the center. So, despite the fact that they could not stop that, they now went on this rampage. Now, what is also happening by the intelligentsia, the house planning intelligentsia, is that they are perfecting at the top level their plan. Do you know federal government funded universities in the far north? If you are not a Muslim, gaining admission into faculties of your choice is a problem. That is, we are talking of um, institutions like Amadou Bello University. Mm -hmm. Fully funded by the federal government. But try getting an admission there. If you are a northerner and you are a Christian, you want to go into the faculty of law, the faculty of engineering, or the faculty of medicine, you will see you will meet a thick wall. And when it comes to even areas of uh, the lower level of education, people who are trying to set up private schools, if it is in the far north, it's virtually impossible. Getting permission to build churches is virtually impossible. It's not, in fact, they do not even stop there. They are declaring some churches that have been in existence for more than 50 years. They are declaring them as illegal structures and beginning to pull them down. And <clears throat> when it comes to the justice system, all you need is to do something 
as a Christian, they are after you. Now, I'm not supporting any act of corruption. As a Christian, if you are a Christian, you should go and work honestly. If you are a governor, you should work honestly. But I'm telling you this, they are in total agreement, even with their members in the judiciary, that whenever a Christian is seen to have done something, they should swim straight ahead go after him. Obade oh, Amelafia just released an audio message to a radio station and they've continuously been harassing me. They've been invited to DSS office over and over again. Well, you have a situation where people have made recordings ordering all Igbo to leave northern Nigeria, giving them 30 days or three months alternative. Nothing, they were not invited. In fact, they were given a pat on the back. And so also the act of industry, this has happened all the way. Now, even when Christians are president, they've always been intimidated not to take a firm stand for Christianity. They've always allowed the Muslims to have their way. In fact, if you look at it, if you look at the history of the Christian presidents, that is starting with Yakubu Gawan, who ruled for eight years, or Basanjo, who ruled for four years, and then later on came back and ruled for another eight years as uh, president. And uh, you look at good luck, uh, Jonathan, who ruled for five years. You look at all their regimes. It was during Gawan's period that all the under severe pressure, all the Christian schools were taken over. All the Christian hospitals were taken over and were vandalized, turned into an image, a shadow of, the, of, their, of, of their old glories. And, and then Obasanjo came to power in 1999. That is when Yerima quickly moved to declare Sharia law in Zamfara State. What Obasanjo would have done, I'm not, uh, I know it's a difficult situation, but if he had declared state of emergency, the remaining nine states would not have declared Sharia law. So once Yerima succeeded, the remaining nine states in the north declared Sharia law. And that is why we are saddled with the sort of problem today that we are, we are facing. So the situation that we are facing is a very, very huge one. We are not uh, saying it's going to be quick to answer. We simply are appealing, appealing to fellow Christians around the whole world, first to help us with prayer, because there's nothing that's above prayer. I love the prayer that was said earlier. To help us with prayers, to help us spread the stories around, let the whole world hear so that somebody will not think that they can take action in isolation and nothing will happen. Because that's what is going to is going to happen. If this lucky massacre had not been greeted with uproar around the whole world, we could have seen more carnage by the federal forces. These are people who couldn't care what they do because they believe if anything, nobody, other nations are busy with their own troubles, so we can sit down at home. But thank God for the social media, thank God for the new world order, that other nations can hear whatever is happening in another country within seconds. And on this, we are uh, casting our hope. But above all, we have never ceased to pray ourselves. Just as we are asking you to pray for us, we continue to pray not just for us but for the whole country because the target is not just northern nigeria northern nigeria is already considered a captured territory the target is also the entire south and they have in their in their you know in their target the southwest in particular is the number one target then the other parts of nigeria will follow so we will continue to pray. We will continue to preach wherever we could and whenever we could. We want you to pray with us. We want you to help us spread the news 
run as we are already doing. So I want to thank you for giving me this privilege to share with you this rather sad experience of the church today, but this is expected. We were never told that it's going to be easy. We were never told that it's going to be a bed of roses. Jesus told us that so have they persecuted the saints before you. So we should be prepared. I'm not praying that I should be persecuted. I should be kidnapped. Like they are doing. That is another angle of the persecution that is going on, kidnapping. Over one billion naira across the whole world has been collected from impoverished society communities, sometimes having to sell off their land so that they can get money to save loved ones. And even sometimes after paying the ransom, the kidnapped victim is still murdered. That is a desperate situation we find ourselves in. We have found the, we have been slapped on one chick. We've turned under the chick. Pray for us. Being a Christian is not the easiest of things. We should continue to pray for our enemies. We should love them. I must be honest with you, I have difficulty in doing that. But that is the commandment. That we should love our enemies. We should pray for them. And so prayer will, will praying will continue to. For this great opportunity to you, I will be and I will answer as can, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, can I just ask uh, uh, if you can turn off your camera? Maybe that would help the quality of your audio. Um, could you have, um, and I'll just, uh, I know that the plan was just for eight to nine, but uh, we're a bit over nine, and I apologize because that's a, a result of a lot of the technical issues that occurred. Um, so in terms of questions, are there any questions, first of all? I've turned off the camera. Yes. Uh, I... Yes. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I've got a que I've got questions. Okay. You may if you like give us your name. Uh my name is Shay. And Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Aruna, for the lecture. And my question is, well, I, I grew up in Nigeria, and uh, I've been attacked twice by Muslims in my life. And the second attack, my self-defense skill saved me. So, and my question is, what is the can? doing to make sure the Christian leaders in the north are fully harmed? That's my question. I, I did it. The, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. What was the question? What is the question I didn't hear it very clearly. What's the Christian Association of Nigeria doing to make sure that Christians are fully armed? Well, to be honest with you, I do not know because the Christian Association of Nigeria only came into being just a few years after uh, the a formidable organization known as the Jamaat to Nasri Islam has come into existence in 1962. And I do not know what is in their constitution, what they are supposed to be doing. Definitely, 
Why are they thinking of intervention politically? Because personally, when people ask me, what is the answer? Well, I cannot move away from the fact that, that we, I have to continue praying as a Christian because that's the biggest weapon that I have, the power of the Holy Spirit. But on earthly terms, on human terms, what are other ish, uh, options do I have? We must make an effort to make sure that Christian leaders are elected into offices. The office of the president of the Federal Republic is not outside the reach of a Christian. If the Christians in Nigeria can unite. The Christians have always been fair to all. You see, like I said, they are always considering the feelings of Muslims. Obasanjo did, Gawan did, good luck have been, a, in fact, it's, it's on record that good luck was the first person to build Almajiri schools. Trillions of Naira was, uh, was spent on that project. No, any, not even a Muslim president has ever done that. So, um, like Kaduna State, which is still about 50-50 Christian. There's no reason why the Christians there should not have an impact politically. Nasrawa state, which is still about 60% Christian, maybe 40% Muslim. There's no reason why a Christian governor should not emerge there. But it has virtually been impossible since the advent of this dispensation. So the Christian Association of Nigeria has a huge task. I don't know what is in their constitution, like I said, but you see, the Muslims are always several steps ahead because we are constrained by what we are taught in the scriptures. But when uh, what did they, we have a saying in Hausa language that says that when the music changes, the, the dancing steps must also change. So we are living under a situation where we have to look at what we do to defend ourselves. And I can say to me, the answer will be in the political arena, where in addition to your prayers, you make sure that the, the, the legislations that are passed are not against Christians. Can you imagine the Kama law that was passed there? Where were these Christian senators? Where were the members of uh, the House of Representatives that are Christians? Why didn't they stop it in its track? So the main thing is to get people into elective offices that are having Christianity central to their thinking not to oppress others, but to make sure fairness is done to all. But whatever laws are passed, they are not laws that will oppress us as Christians. We've never oppressed anybody, no Christian leader, no Christian president, no Christian governor, not to, onto my record, that has gone out his way to make sure that Muslims do not have their rights. So we should not be in a situation where we have governments in place that are treating us with complete recklessness and like what the governor of Kaduna State is doing today. He does not believe that a Christian should even live, let alone to talk of have any place in society. Since Erufa became governor, he has dismissed more than 60,000 Christians from the civil service and the teaching profession. When he dismissed them, he didn't pay them any gratuity. He didn't give them any pension. They are just wallowing in abject poverty. So many of them returned to the land to go and till the land. This same land is one that they have unleashed the Fulani harassment in a genocidal attack to dislodge them from. So there's a big problem. 
The Christian Association, like I said, their responsibility is to motivate all Christians politically, I must say, because um, in addition to prayer, that's what you will do. I hope that will answer your question. I am not a member of the Christian Association. Uh, I have don't, I'm not in the hierarchy. I don't know what they do, but Thank you. to me, I believe this is what they should be. Thank you very much, sir. Someone asked the question. They should be like a professional group. Thank you very much, sir. Someone asked a question, uh, says, why are Christians so naive about the political reality? Um, that question was on the chat box. Well, the first thing is, I must say, the early missionaries that came to Northern Nigeria played a role in making sure that Christians shy away from things like, in fact, when I was growing up, it was considered a sin to join the army. It was, it was considered a sin to join the civil service. It was, oh, it's even a more terrible sin to be a businessman. So let alone to talk of going into politics, that is very sinful. All that the missionaries taught our parents to do is to be pastors, to be evangelists, to be farmers, to be teachers. Anything going outside this area is considered that you are preparing yourself to go to hell. And nobody wants to go to hell after his death. So many, many years. It's very, very difficult. It's still very, very difficult today to deprogram our mindset from this condition that we are positioned to be. And that is why you see, even as of today, the wealth in the North is held by few Muslims. Within the Christian communities, you cannot count, say, up to five or 10 billionaires. But if you go far north, you have thousands of billionaires, thousands of billionaires. Some of you have never heard of them, but they are in their thousands. Then, of course, there's no middle class. The next thing you have there is the level of very, very poor Almagiris who depend on these people for handouts. And this is mainly because, of course, we have very good farmlands, which the Fulanis are fighting to take over from us. Uh, but I think people are waking up to reality. We have to be involved in politics. We have to decide our own future by ourselves. And I must say, the new movement which happened with this NSAS, to me, was a welcome development. The issue of collateral damage by hoodlums, notwithstanding. But I think for the youth, the present youth and the youth to come, it's a wake up call that they should take the future of their country in their hands. A religious bigotry must be thrown out of the window. Sudan tried it. Sudan tried it for more than 25 years to subjugate Southern Sudan. They eventually end up splitting up the country. And they had all the support of all the fanatic Muslim nations as they could for more than 25 years. But today, Sudan has collapsed. So the Nigerian youth must never, particularly the Muslim youth, during this NSAS movement, a young politician called AG went on the air to tell 
Northerners that Northerners should never buy the idea of NSARS. That is a plot to unseat Muhammad Buhari. So whether Muhammad Buhari is performing or not, all Northerners must back him. That is complete the, an action out of order. Northerners cannot continue to support an inept government. They must rule for the benefit of all Nigerians, not just a section of the country. But like I said, the NSAS movement, which has escalated into other areas, either demands for justice, for fair play, it's a welcome development for the whole Nigeria. So um, my Northern friends, my Northern Christians, the young ones, and those that are still able-bodied to go into politics, they should go into politics. However, because experience has shown that whenever people go into politics, they experience they see money that they've never seen before, they become corrupt. And I want to urge all Christians to be Christ-like. Whether you are a politician, you are a businessman, you are a teacher, you are a soldier, or whatever you get yourself into, you should brighten the corner where you are. So that somebody from afar may see the light of Jesus in you. No matter what the situation is, you cannot say, oh, it's, I've seen a lot of Christians who went in and they said, well, they couldn't resist it. No, that's not an excuse. You are first and foremost a Christian, and a Christian you should be, no matter what the circumstances. Christians must learn to stand firm, because the fear of that is what has made many Christians to shy away. So you have nothing to lose by standing firm as a Christian, whatever the situation may be. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. Okay, I, I have a question. Actually, I have several, but I'll, I'll start with one. Um, about three or four years ago, in Arise magazine, um, a gentleman called um, Fred Williams, who um, runs an organization. Uh, he, 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 he used to be, in, I think, just of Kaduna as a pastor. He narrated a story of where his church was attacked. And he said he stood side by side with many people. And he said, with guns, by the way, because his family had been threatened. He said he was going to fight. And then God spoke to him. And the title of the article he wrote, he said, uh, love is more violent than terror. Um, but ever since then, I have heard other people talk about the necessity to arm Christians and to give them guns to fight back. So, um, and this is a very delicate question. I understand that there are security implications and you do not have to answer. But what is the balance at the moment among Christians in the North? regarding how to respond to, and if you do not want to answer, please don't, regarding how to respond to the arm attacks that are taking place. Honestly, there's no any balance. The reason why I can say that without even thinking, uh, Christians, how many Christians can, <laughs> We are talking of people who are looking for 1,000 Naira to buy food. How can they afford even a, a very good machete, which costs about 1,000 Naira itself? Many of them cannot afford to buy that, let alone to talk of acquiring weapons. So the I believe those who uh, uh, are, uh, uh, are able to maybe, I don't know, 
bow and arrows and things like that is <laughs> all that they can muster. But more than anything else, is calling on the government continuously embarrassing them. And you must know that the Nigerian army as it stands today is no longer a reliable army. Don't forget that just recently they mentioned that they are bringing in 600 repentant Boko Haram terrorists into injecting them into the Nigerian army. Where on earth can you ever see this happen? But it's happening in Nigeria. So even when you say you are calling on the security services to come and defend you, some of them are terrorists themselves. That's what we have seen at the Lekki Paul Gate. They are simply reckless individuals that have found themselves into the security services. And if they are fanatics to the core, they don't care. They will just wreck any havoc as much as they could. So um, definitely the Christians have no, they have no weapons. I don't think if they're interested in securing any weaponry, but the issue of self-defense, if a person is coming to your house, if you can face him with a bow and arrow, you might face him with a bow and arrow. But more than anything else is, we will continue to call on the government to do its duty, securing lives and property is the sole responsibility of government. And that is why the issue of politics cannot be dismissed. It's something that has to be considered very, very seriously. Personally, I think it's the best future for Nigeria that politics should be made to work. Let votes count. If you don't like any government, you throw them out. If that is really effective in Nigeria, you will see that government will begin to emerge. That will be safe to the feelings of all Nigerians. See, if we sit down, we have a governor a president who will come in, appoint all service chiefs, security agencies, left, center, and right, surround him with them, and cascade it down the line. They on turn recruit people that will protect them and that will implement their own agenda and get away with it. Election after election, they are being re-elected. Then we have a problem. Then we have a big problem. But if they know that they can be voted out, I believe they will come, they will have a second thought about their actions or inactions. Thank you very much, sir. Um, yeah. I will urge anybody to read that article, by the way. It's a very powerful uh, testimony of how God spoke to this guy and said to him, um, essentially, you have no right to kill someone. And the title of that article in Arise, I think it was uh, 2018, is Love is More Violent Than Terror. And I, um, but I know that it's about, um, it's getting close to 10, so we're well past our time. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I want to repeat two or three things. One of them is that as a fellowship, the OFNC is definitely committed, one, to pray for Christians who are facing persecution in Nigeria and all over the world. Every Monday evening, the National Executive Council from 10 to 11 has a prayer meeting, and it's always one of the prayer points. The OFNC is committed to giving, as we all know, and I want to thank everyone who gave for about two or three years. We were building a project, setting up um, a place for internally displaced people down south in Edo State. Um, and a lot of them had come from up north. And part of the issues that were raised, in fact, someone, when someone said, why was it being built in Edo State? They said, they said, they said even government officials were telling them to go back north. And they were saying, no, they don't want to go back Hello. because they will face... 
Yeah. Yes. I think Sumer uh, booked it. I'm, I'm okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, can that person continue? Um, so um, I think the, 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 they asked the people, they said, why don't you go back north? And I mean, these are government officials telling them to go back home. And they said, no, that they would not go back because they were likely to face persecution. So they were essentially running away from where they were. So the OFNC has been there. The OFNC is committed to advocacy, as I said at the beginning. We've spoken to members of parliament. We've been to Nigeria High Commission. What I would like to ask people to do now, um, we generally, we meet once a month, uh, the group of people who talk about this. But if you can take the message of today to your branches, to your churches, and in your daily lives, it is not just a national thing to pray. It's not just a national thing to organize events. Each one of us, as you feel led of the Holy Spirit, please feel free to. Mm -hmm. Anyone who wishes to contact me for more information, my email is um, ifeolu.akintunde at ifeolu.akintunde at ofnc.org.uk. But even if you don't know that, just send, a, send an email to info at ofnc.org.uk and it will be directed to me. Um, I also think we need to start changing the narrative. I grew up in the South and in my history books and even on BBC reports, they say the North is majority Muslim, the South is majority Christian. As I've grown up, I found that actually that's not true. Um, I, was, I was just saying that I was looking at somebody's work the other day um, and the person said to me, this was around the time of Chibok, and she said to me, oh, that she comes from near Chibok. And I knew she was a Christian. So I was like, do you? She said, yeah. And it was only then that I realized that the majority of people in that area were Christians. I know I lived in just for a year, but I, I never quite got a hang of the fact that the North is not as majority Muslim as everybody says. Our history books in primary school, the BBC reporters, the churches in the UK actually say that the North is majority Muslim and the South is majority Christian. And this is actually not true. So even we as Christians, we need to be changing the narrative. We need to be speaking out on these issues as much as we can. Because if we don't, that whole idea will remain. It will continue. Um, someone once made the point that it's interesting that one of the large states with the largest population is Kano, and yet Kano is supposed to be um, savannah and desert and all kinds of things. How did it happen? And it was only then that it occurred to me that that actually might be a point. Um, so there's quite a lot of erroneous information that's floating around that we as Christians are allowing to float around. But the more important thing is, in the Bible it says, let, let justice flow. Let, well, I can't remember, Amos 5 something, let righteousness flow like an ever flowing stream or something. We need to pray for righteousness. We need to pray for justice. We need to pray for God's glory. Um, and thank you very much for coming. I hope that the result of this meeting is that there is a louder cry in churches all over the country. There's a bigger work all over the UK and outside of the UK in saying there are people who need to be freed from oppression. There are people who are suffering for the name of Christ and that we as Christians should not stand by. No matter where we are, no matter what we do, there are our brothers and there are our sisters, people who prayed for Peter when he was in prison. They didn't go, ah, Peter is in prison. Hmm, okay. No, it said in the Bible that prayers, intercession was continually made for him. And that's what we should do. Continually, non-stop. Thank you all very much for attending. Um, if you want to find out more, we'll keep you informed. And you will, when this, through your area secretary, you can ask your area, any, anyone can tell you how to contact me to tell the truth. So um, I wonder who's going to say the closing prayer for this evening. Uh, I don't want to pick somebody. It, it, 
if I, if I, I'm, I'm happy to do so. This is Baba. Ah, and just to say thank God you. bless you, sir. <laughs> uh, God just to say thank you, you to Nuhu uh, for an excellent uh, uh, summary. So uh, shall we pray? Yes, thank sir. you. Bye-bye, sir. How are you? Thank you very much. Shall we pray? Father, we want to honor you. And Lord, we want to thank you. And we thank you for um, the fact that, Lord, you've given us a country that uh, we can call our own. And Lord, it is not by accident. Uh, it is for a purpose that, Lord, we will glorify and honor your name. And I pray, oh God, that as we look at various options on how to respond, that truly, Lord, you help us to respond with love, but also help us to respond with faith and help us to respond with wisdom and wisdom from above. Father, we pray that, God, you help us to recognize the fact that, God, it is our country and we have a stake in it. And we have a stake in it to make it great. And that, Lord, um, even as you had promised the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail, Amen. Lord, may the church stand. And may, us, may, may we, as individuals, also continue to advance the purpose which you've called us into your kingdom. We pray for your protection. We pray for our communities. Lord, we pray for the government, that, Lord, you will raise them to do what they need to do and what they must do. And that, Lord, you will not leave them at peace until, Lord, they respond to what is right. And we pray, God, that they will rule with fairness, that they will rule with um, a clear expression of what is right for the nation. We thank you, Lord, and we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you comfort them and the Lord, you provide um, relief for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all very much for attending. Amen. We hope this continues. We hope the movement doesn't stop until every single one is free in Jesus' name.